John Arms and I uh, and Jason are partners in Voyager U, uh, which is a portfolio company of mine, and uh, they're doing good things, and John will uh, maybe dribble something out on that while he introduces Jason, and so everybody, welcome John Arms. Thank you. I'll dribble something out there. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'll try to dribble something about Voyager in, but uh, uh, it's, that's not my thing today. My thing today is to introduce Jason. That's my responsibility, and I'll try to do a good job here. So uh, I have had the amazing blessing and opportunity to be a partner, friend, colleague, uh, called Jason an advisor for several years, and I'm very lucky for it. Um, through that process, we've done a lot of good things together. Uh, Voyager U is just one. But I've known Jason for so long, and you get to know him in a certain way. He's a certain kind of guy. And uh, I can say one thing after all these, these years of get, knowing Jason is that Jason has issues. <laughs> J Jason has issues, and uh, that, that's, so, that's some of the good part about Jason. So um, at his core, Jason is a problem solver. And he has told me on several occasions when we have deep late in the night strategic discussions is that we can't solve a problem until we can see that problem very, very clearly. And Jason has a gift for that. Um, going back to his issues, uh, lately Jason has had issues with the way we do history in America and academia and in the business world, and those issues have come to light. Jason's issue with issues with history is we tend to look at it, um, it's not as relevant for entrepreneurs and startups. We talk about wars and we talk about politics in history, and there's a lot more to it than that, and that's one of the many uh, issues that Jason Jason uh, seeks to address. So um, in his two most recent books, which I believe you have a couple up here, uh, the first is Marketer in Chief, great book that recasts all the presidents as a marketer in chief of the country. So it's a great way to look at history in a way we haven't before. So I encourage you to read that. Uh, and then with Booze Babe and a Little Black Dress, which he's gonna talk about today, he's um, endeavoring to make history relevant for those of us in the room and a useful tool because it can be if we look at it through a certain light, through Jason's light. So um, history, as Jason has told me before, is a wonderful guide and teacher if we choose to use it that way. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author, marketer, entrepreneur, and man with issues, uh, Jason Voyevich. All right, thank you. Everyone can you hear me okay? Perfect. All right. Well, let's, let's get started. Uh, you know, if you're like me, you learned in your American history class that the last time an invasion force reached the mainland of the United States was during the War of 1812. Uh, the conflict was sort of a mess. It, it kind of resolved very, very little. But the Brits did, if you remember, manage to burn down the White House. Since then, as the story goes, Canada and Mexico posed little threat from the north and south, and more to the point, kind of the vast distances of the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean significantly and successfully deterred future invasion-y thinking. But that's not entirely true. We did endure another invasion for over a decade, and the US military was powerless to stop it. Uh, the invasion started January 17th, 1920, a little more than 100 years ago. The invasion force lined up precisely three miles off the eastern seaboard of the United States, from Maine to Miami, though it did concentrate its forces uh, near the major population centers. In fact, there were so many transport ships that their guide lights were clearly visible from Boston Harbor. If those transport ships, though, were filled with an invading army, people probably would have been frightened but no one was frightened. They wanted them to be there. You've probably guessed by now that these boats weren't carrying soldiers. They were carrying something just as dangerous, though, to the authority of the United States government. They were carrying booze. Tons and tons and tons of booze. But that invasion force couldn't simply dock at Boston Harbor. The Volstead Act, which was written to enforce national prohibition, mandated that liquor could not come within three miles of shore. 
So to get the invasion force ashore, the transport ships needed smaller, faster craft, with captains able to navigate light, tight backwater channels at night to avoid detection. It really wasn't easy. Uh, now, why would these captains risk prison or death on the open water if they were to be sunk for as much hooch as you could store in the bottom of a 16-foot wooden boat? Uh, probably the same reason anyone risks so much to skirt the law. Money. A lot of money. Now, how much money? And I want to put this in perspective for everyone. The commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, the person and the group responsible for protecting our shore against all of this, earned somewhere shy of $6,000 per year. Uh, do the math, that's about $92,000 today. An average sailor on one of his clipper ships earned $1,500. That's about $23,000 today. You would be better off at Burger King than that. Uh, now, can you see where this is going? Of course you can. A good rum runner with a fast boat could make several hundred thousand dollars in 1920s money. Uh, it was a good business if you had the stomach for it. But let's be clear, the Coast Guard wasn't dumb. Uh, but the fleet was designed for search and rescue, not racing down little speedboats. They needed faster boats if they were going to have any hope of stemming the tide of illegal booze into the United States. And in the early 1920s, Congress did what Congress does, and it appropriated the funds for newer, faster clipper ships designed to give the rum runners a run for their money. Uh, well, like any good request for proposal, this one needed to go out for bid. Okay. Every shipyard on the east coast of the United States had a copy of the specifications, which meant so did the rum runners. Can you guess what happened next? Of course you can. Hey, the rum runners paid the shipbuilders to build them a boat that could outrun the new clippers. Now, and if you're careful, you can still see some of them today, actually a few miles from where we're sitting on the waters of Lake Minnetonka. Now owned by people with a lot less tolerance for risk, uh, some of the originals, uh, original boats designed by someone named John Hacker. The original, Hackercraft, and the boats now named after him. Uh, they're beautiful, really, but the rum runners didn't buy them for their looks. Runabouts like these have large holds, sleek designs, and just shockingly powerful motors for how big they are, uh, generating speeds at the time of over 50 to 60 miles per hour on the water. They essentially invented hydroplaning uh, and basically the entire speedboat industry after Prohibition ended. And they all learned about it from a public RFP. So this is the first lesson of the day you're not going to learn in history class from a teacher or a history professor in college. Pay attention to government requests for proposals in your industry, even if you don't sell to the public sector. Uh, the, outside of the Department of Defense, the US government cannot keep secrets. They may give you some pretty important clues about your product, service, or market. Now, you know, when I think about this, one of the criticisms I often get telling stories like that, and some of the stories I'm going to tell you, is that it can be a bit distasteful to think of rum runners as entrepreneurs. And yeah, maybe it is. But I wonder, is that any different than Uber or Airbnb? Basically skirting and often violating the laws in order to build their business and open new markets? I'm not really sure it's that different. Today, we are going to take a very different look at the Roaring Twenties. That's not because professional historians, filmmakers, academics, and journalists can't tell good stories, but they don't see the world the way we see the world. They aren't looking for the evidence, the patterns, and the lessons that are important to us as entrepreneurs and innovators. So this isn't going to be like any history lesson or lecture that you've had. I can't promise you won't be offended uh, but I can promise it will be useful. So maybe even some fun. So speaking of fun, let's get back to that 13-year-old illegal booze party. We need to clear up a little misconception about prohibition first before we get started. It wasn't a complete ban on alcoholic beverages. In fact, the loopholes were so large you could steer a tanker ship through them. 
Uh, one of the most fun examples that I like was the sacrificial wine business, which incidentally saved Napa Valley during Prohibition. Uh, thank the Catholics, by the way. Uh, they bought barrels and barrels of wine for, from the region through the religious practices exemption. It was shitty, my, shitty wine made from shitty grapes. Uh, but without it, uh, we'd have no award-winning Cabernet today. Uh, that wasn't the fun part. The fun part is that because of the First Amendment, you didn't need to be Catholic to take advantage of the loophole. Any religion would do. All you needed to do was show you were a preacher with a congregation. Can you guess what happened next? <laughs> of course you can. Mail order priests, pastors, and rabbis set up a shop in basically every major city, advertised for parishioners, and then provided them with a walk-up spiritual experience. But despite a certain religious revival during the 1920s, the major distillers, brewers, and wine growers were technically out of business. That meant the supply chain was disrupted and many old saloons shut down. Uh, the liquor industry, then and now, pretty heavily subsidizes drink establishments. That's what all those Bud Light signs are. Uh, they buy the stools, they buy the bar rails. Bars could not exist without the liquor industry. And that was really the heart of the matter, because the major advocate for prohibition, the Anti-Saloon League, sorta had a point. Saloons were places where men drank, gambled, and slept away their money. Uh, it ruined lives and families in a way we can't quite understand today. Uh, it also didn't help that most brewers were Germans and most wine growers were Catholics. Uh, racism and ethnic uh, religious uh, discrimination was a much bigger and different deal back then. So when the women's suffrage movement found common cause with the ASL, prohibition passed the constitutional amendment process faster and easier than anyone would have guessed. So let's recap. Alcohol was illegal, but as we've already seen, you don't line up thousands of booze containers three miles offshore for a brew it and where they will come ocean of dreams. People wanted to drink and they were going to get it. But who would give it to them? There simply weren't enough pastors to go around. And here's where we meet Al Capone, uh, though he wasn't certainly the only mobster to get his tax break from the US government. And yes, I said tax break. And no, it wasn't intentional, but lots of things in my talk today weren't intentional, and it doesn't really matter. The effect was the same. Uh, we need to run a little thought experiment to help explain kind of how that works. Let's say your beer cost a dollar, and I'm saying a dollar because the math is easy, not because a beer cost a dollar in the 1920s. Of that dollar, about 20 cents would go to various state, local, federal coffers. But as the consumer, what do you pay? You don't pay 80 cents. You pay a dollar. Do you see where this is going? Of course you can. The mob didn't lower the end consumer price. They simply pocketed the difference. They pocketed a 20% margin on every bottle of hooch they sold. Okay? I want to pause here for a second. Things like low-level gambling, prostitution, breaking kneecaps, all the things the mob is really good at doing, uh, isn't actually all that profitable. Okay? There isn't that much volume in those kind of businesses. They're highly labor intensive by design, and they only intend to attract a pretty less reputable customer base. Booze, on the other hand, has lots of potential customers and was and is very, very profitable, even without the tax break. Various mobsters were basically falling over each other and shooting each other too, let's be clear, to control the bootlegging rackets in their cities and things did get pretty violent. Uh, did you know that Al Capone was in his early 20s when he took over the mob in Chicago? Most people don't. Uh, and we won't go into the brutality with which he did it. He was not a nice man, though there is a story about a baseball bat to the skull uh, to a colleague after dinner that probably isn't true. Uh, but let's not kind of follow the historian's storyline about kind of the salacious details. That's where we get stuck. Let's take a look at this from the consumer's point of view, because that's kind of what we're interested in, right? We've all heard the term speakeasy, sort of as the place you would go to indulge your naughty tipple. Uh, and if you believe all the popular media, all speakeasies were nestled behind unmarked doors with secret knocks and passwords. It was all sort of cloak and dagger and kind of James Bond. 
And it makes for great TV and movies, but it wasn't true. Uh, the successful speakeasies had fronts. A legitimate reason you'd walk down the street in public in broad daylight where the police could see you. Uh, in other words, the front was a facade, kind of the polite fiction, kind of the story you could tell about where you were going. And the first thing you've got to understand about speakeasies in the 1920s is there's a lot of competition. There are a lot of places you could go to get a drink. So people had plenty of choices. And if you're going to risk your freedom for a drink, you're not going to go into some creepy dude's garage for some bathtub hooch. In other words, the speakeasies weren't the innovation. They were the table stakes, the bar stakes. Uh, the fronts were the differentiators. How? Well, let's ask Al Capone. He created the modern club scene in Chicago. Okay? He hired and in at least one case kidnapped all of the best jazz performers migrating from New Orleans to avoid Jim Crow to go play in his clubs. And would you simply sit on your hands and clap at the end of a performance? Well, hell no, jazz is dance music. And when people wanted to dance, it wasn't just like a sausage fest like the old saloons. Women wanted to go drink with the men now that they were liberated. This is another one of those unintended consequences, by the way. The suffrage advocates didn't think women would want to go drinking. Uh, they were, what's the word I'm searching for? Wrong. <laughs> now, if women were at your club, they sure as hell, and ladies, you can vouch for this, they sure as hell didn't want to go squat over a bucket outside to use the bathroom like in the old saloon days. Capone and his clubs built the first powder rooms. Okay? In fact, Capone's clubs were so appealing that after Prohibition, they prospered. Now, Capone's entrepreneurial genius was realizing where the true differentiation was. The booze was a means to an end, not the end in and of itself. This is your second lesson of the day you won't learn from your history, professor. True opportunity doesn't come from breaking the rules. It comes from what breaking the rule allows you to do. Okay? Uber broke the rule of monopolized taxis, but what it really did was make it easier for you to get a ride from an app on your phone. Okay? Airbnb broke the rule that, need, that you needed to stay in a generic hotel when you traveled. But what it really did was create kind of a one-of-a-kind experience in a new place. Now, if you were listening carefully, I seem to imply that gambling wasn't that big of a deal for the mob before the 1920s. That's because it wasn't. And the reason it wasn't is that most of the biggest gambling operations come from sports betting. And sports wasn't that big of a deal. But that, as is evidenced by number three here from New York, was about to change. Okay? But before we can talk about the babe, and we'll get to his impact on the game, we need to understand the state of sports in general, and baseball specifically. Uh, when you lived on a farm, like most people did in the 1920s, you didn't need sports. Okay? Sports were a luxury afforded to very few people. Farms and ranches, anyone here on a farm or a ranch has lived on a farm or a ranch? A few. You don't need sports. It's hard work all by itself. There wasn't a lot of time for organized sports for most people. And not only that, uh, people were spread pretty far apart. The logistics of organizing a team of more than just a few people was actually pretty tough. That started to change, though, as people moved into the cities and needed time to, for recreation and camaraderie. The only problem was that sports, especially baseball, was really boring. Okay? This was the so-called, those of you who have studied this era and understand it, this was the dead ball era in the 19-teens. Okay? It was a strategic, low-scoring game with a lot of bunts, base hits, stolen bases. Okay? It was so boring, in fact, that the biggest entertainment was when fights would break out in the stands between fans, fans and umpires, umpires and players, players and players. Uh, it was a mess. There's a kind of an old saying, kind of like hockey today, that you'd go to the ballpark and a baseball game might break out. Hey, not exactly family friendly. About two trends uh, were working to change that. The first was a rule change. Hey, the reason the game was so low scoring is that pitchers doctored the ball. Uh, hey, hitting a round ball 
with a round bat is one of the hardest things to do in all of sports. Okay? And it's even harder when the ball doesn't get replaced during the game, which it didn't in that era. So by later innings, uh, with not very good lighting, that ball was nearly impossible to hit. There's even one guy who died from a ball to the head. Okay? Seeing their revenue decline, baseball owners do what baseball owners do, and they wanted to shift the balance of power from pitchers and fielding to hitters because that's the excitement level of the game, and that's what keeps people interested in the game and keeps them from slugging each other in the stands. Not great, not family friendly. That's where Babe Ruth comes in, sort of, but kind of not in the way you'd think. But more on that in a second. I haven't told you about the second trend. The second change in sports was more important, the radio. Okay? Instead of a few thousand people slugging it out in the stands, watching the game, sort of, tens or hundreds of thousands of people could be listening to the game as it was being played. Uh, that not only dramatically increases the audience, but it increases the advertising audience. And uh, that's the, that was the way that baseball owners were going to help improve their financial position. But that said, baseball owners were pretty skeptical of the whole thing. You kind of need to understand that in 1923, 100 years ago, uh, radio in that era was like Pets.com in 1998, or, forgive me, uh, uh, Justin, kind of like what passes for AI in 2023. Uh, no, one knew what it was, no one knew what it was for. There was a lot of hype, and there was really no business model. Most radio stations of the day put on no more than two or three hours of programming each day. Okay, the rest of the time was dead air. Anyone want to advertise on dead air? Okay, there's no reason to listen, no reason to pay, no reason to advertise. That is until newspaper owner Walter Strong hired an aspiring journalist, Judith Carey Waller, to manage his floundering radio station, WMAQ, in Chicago. Uh, job number one for her was programming. Okay, if the station wasn't on the air, it wasn't delivering value. Okay? It could never hope it to make any money if it wasn't delivering any value. And through entrepreneurial trial and error, she discovered that if you put on a short musical performance on the radio, people would go to see the performance live. And if you had a lecture from an author, for instance, people would go buy the book. <laughs> Hint, okay. Now that helped, but it certainly wasn't enough. Now, so the story goes, she heard about a friend's son who missed the Cubs play because he was sick. So she had an idea. She got up the guts to go pitch William Wrigley. Yeah, that William Wrigley, uh, whose Cubs were struggling at the turnstile and at the plate. Uh, and after some doing, she convinced him to broadcast Cubs games on the radio. Uh, why was that such a big deal? Baseball, as we know, plays a lot of games, okay, which fills up a lot of airtime. Uh, they also play at different times of the day. Okay? Now, why was that important? Demographics. Okay? During day games, who listened to day games? Moms and their kids. So she could convince home products advertisers to pony up. Now, at night, it was more men and kind of the whole family, so she targeted advertisers to reach them some of the very first market segmentation by day part. It was utterly new, and she created it from, full, from whole cloth. Can you guess what happened next? Well, of course you can. By the end of the decade, William Wrigley in Wrigley Field drove the highest in-person attendance of any ballpark in the country, even surpassing the New York Yankees and making Wrigley and his gum a household name. Now, that doesn't really explain why Babe Ruth was such a big deal to baseball. Uh, to most people, he was such a great hitter that it drove people's interest in the game. Not really. It was something else. Okay? Imagine for a moment listening to a baseball game on the radio, and lots of people still do to this day. It's actually one of the most popular ways to listen uh, to experience baseball is on the radio. But imagine listening to it with only the play-by-play -play announcements. Got it in your head? Think about that. Just the play-by-play. -play. Nothing else. What do you notice? 
dead air. Okay? That's because baseball has a lot of dead time between plays uh, where not a whole lot happens. Okay? People who paid money for a ticket to a ballpark aren't going to just get up and leave, and if you did, you, you'd know it. You could see them. Here's the problem with radio, though. If your game is boring and people get up and leave, you never know. Advertisers hate that. Okay? The solution is the part of the broadcast I told you to ignore, color commentary. Okay? That's the second person in the broadcast booth, usually, whose job it is to tell you the why behind what's happening, the strategy, and most importantly, kind of the interesting personal stories of the players. And do you know who is really interesting? Babe Ruth. Uh, he had an instinct for publicity that few other players did ever, then or now. Uh, part of it was just a lucky bro, kind of a lucky break. He was loud, he was brash, he was a womanizer, he was a boozer during prohibition, and, and this is the important part, would say as much when asked by the newspapers. Okay? Uh, it also helped to be in New York. Uh, out of Boston, which is kind of the loudest, brashest market in the world. It gave color commentators endless fodder for kind of the human interest side of the, the game and made it interesting for even for people who didn't really like baseball. And that was the true reason, in my opinion, we remember him. Now, this may seem like some blasphemy to baseball fans, some of which are here uh, in the room, but I would argue that Babe Ruth wasn't all that good. And I know, just stay with me. When you check his stats, like baseball folks are want to do, he was tremendously hot and cold during that time. He had flashes of real brilliance uh, with the number of home runs, of course. But even that kind of unpredictability in his play and in his season and the unpredictable things he might say or do uh, there's an old story that when you roomed with Babe Ruth, when you traveled with him, you roomed with his suitcase uh, because he'd be out on the town the entire night. Okay? So he could do some stuff, and it was just media gold. Uh, you know, kind of love him or hate him, and at the time he was kind of an equal measure, you didn't ignore him. Okay? And Babe, Ru Babe Ruth's lesson kind of parallels Al Capone's here. In Capone's case, Alcohol wasn't the innovation. The experience around it was. In Ruth's case, there were better ball players. Lou Gehrig is probably one. Okay? But he was at the right place at the right time to take advantage of a new technology and what it could offer to draw people into the sport that would become, of course, America's pastime. But the real innovator is someone many of you just met, Judy Waller. She had the guts. Not only to recognize a new technology, but most importantly, to make it work. Okay? Today, it's not cloud or IoT or crypto or AI that's the answer. They are not the answer. It's what those things allow you to do that you couldn't do before. That's the answer. Okay? As Ruth might say, don't confuse baseball with the game. Okay? Now, speaking of games. You might have noticed that I mentioned that women started to enjoy and attend baseball games. They were already hitting Capone's club scene, so this wasn't really a big surprise. But I want you to think about it for a second and imagine walking into the stadium down the street, Target Field, in a full-length gown and whalebone crinoline. Okay? Get that in your head. Men, this will be tough. Women, you might have put one of these on in your lives. It'd be hard to get through the turnstile much less fit inside an 18-inch seat. Now, when you look at photos from the back half of the 1920s, you'll notice that women aren't wearing those complex dresses any longer. Uh, their hair is shorter, too. Uh, and they're wearing jewelry that matches their simpler clothes and more durable fabrics. And more than one of them might be wearing what we might today call a little black dress. Coco Chanel, by the way, is uh, the only non-American during my talk today, and only one of two in the entire book, uh, both French, by the way. Uh, but simply being French and being into fashion was not what made Coco Chanel so special. Uh, by day, 
uh, Coco Chanel was a seamstress. Okay? So she understood the mechanics of clothing much like Henry Ford understood the mechanics of automobiles. But also like Ford, she was more than a technician. Okay? At night, Chanel was a performer. Uh, the French word, and you're gonna forgive the pronunciation, I did ask Google for this, pouzous. Uh, quite literally, that means kind of the act between acts. Uh, her job was to make sure that her mostly military clientele didn't leave to go to the bathroom between major acts and go home. Okay? It's a tough job, and she was very, very good at it. She would use her costumes to entertain, and let's not dance around the subject, provoke and seduce her audience. These were soldiers and officers, after all, and Chanel knew her audience. And in her own words, she was smoking hot. <laughs> uh, her words, not mine. Uh, a quick sidebar for the investors in the room. Uh, watch for people who are good at combining experiences. Specialists rarely make good entrepreneurs. Combiners do. Okay. So, back to Coco. Uh, she realized that fashion is a lot more than what you wear. It's a performance. Okay. Fashion defines your identity, or at least the identity you want to portray to the world. It was and is a complete sensory experience. Now, let's break that down. First thing is the obvious one, and that's the look. Okay. Chanel is most famous for the iconic little black dress. Now, most of the women I know own one, most several, or at least they own some variant of one. And if you own a sundress, that's basically the same idea for a different venue. Okay? Uh, instead of the hours-long assembly process of 19th century gowns, uh, the little black dress was revolutionary because it was everyday fashion. It had a sleek black silhouette, and it was even a little bit boxy by today's standards. And if you've seen one, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, very simple black color. It was practical and it didn't show stains. Now, if you're struggling to imagine how big of a change this is, think of the dresses you saw in shows like The Outlander. Okay? Uh, these are massive structured dresses. And as women's role in society was changing, the fashion needed to change with it. Okay? All that said, it was a little tough to convince women in France, and America for that matter, to wear one, so Chanel invented runway modeling. Okay? She would hire attractive women from the streets of Paris to put on her clothes and walk up and down the front of her boutique. You know, uh, Chanel understood intuitively three of the most important rules in marketing. Number one, you can't sell anything if people can't know about it. Number two, you won't, see, you won't sell it if people can't visualize, visualize themselves using it. And number three, if you want to reach a mass market, you better make it affordable. And contrary to the popular kind of modern conception of French hot couture, Chanel did not want to design fashion for the elites. She was for the everyday woman, and that meant cheaper and more durable materials. And specifically, and this is the funny part, uh, she made her dresses from the same material as men's underwear of the time. <laughs> Let's just say that Chanel was an expert in the touch and feel of that particular fabric. And I will be clear, as much as Babe Ruth was a womanizer, uh, Coco Chanel was a manizer? I don't know if that's a word, but it should be, and it fits her, okay? So, if Chanel is most famous for her dress, she is probably second most famous for what? Her fragrance, Chanel number five, okay? It was important that women smelled a certain way ideally when her suitor was close enough to notice. So, let's recap. Women of the 1920s showed more skin in Chanel's dresses, dancing at Capone's clubs and smelling alongside eligible men. Stay with me, you see where this is going. Wrigley's gum was kind of a necessary taste of that fashion. But the most important thing was how Coco Chanel talked. It was her attitude. That was the part of the fashion experience. All of those factors came together in a new type of outspoken person uh, that Coco Chanel really was. She was the type who was outspoken herself and encouraged other people and other women specifically to do that as well. And contrary to the popular belief about our chaste past, 
and kind of what men and women liked during that era. Women of the 1920s spoke very freely, and the men loved it. Absolutely loved it. Now, Chanel was undoubtedly successful. Uh, she paid off her initial investors within two years. Okay? And to this day, built a global fashion empire that still holds her name. And kind of a fun fact, the Coco Chanel logo, anyone have Coco Chanel, a Chanel purse or something here? That logo with the two interlocking Cs, she designed that herself. Okay? But remember, you don't need a fashion brand to create a full sensory experience. You simply need to stretch your imagination like Coco did. Uh, she would challenge you to consider how your product or service engages all the senses. If you doubt me, consider the electrical sales reps who brings j donuts to a job site. Okay? He's on to something. Don't underestimate the little things that add a new dimension to your offer. But I think the most important lesson for us as entrepreneurs is this. Uh, our perspectives are too narrow. Okay? I study innovation as a hobby, not just a career. Uh, and I will tell you the vast majority of what I read in this genre are case studies of other companies written by those companies uh, or people who want to sell to those companies. You want to launch a new medical device? Here are 10 other medical device case studies you can look at. Want to launch a new SaaS business? Here are 10 KPIs you need to pay attention to. And books on the subject aren't much better. You know, most of those today are written by consultants trying to sell you something. Okay? Even the best ones, like good to great, are full of pretty thoroughly discredited case studies by failed companies. We just needed to wait a few extra years after they were done being published. Okay? In other words, the innovation literature, such as it is, demonstrates a profound lack of imagination. Okay? I think it's why most of us lie about having read it. We know it doesn't help. Okay? The best thing you can do to expand your mind as an entrepreneur and as an innovator is expand your reading list. Okay? Sure, some of the people you run into might offend you. Okay? I don't expect anyone here to admire Al Capone. You shouldn't. He was a bad dude. Okay? Babe Ruth would be arrested today. Uh, certainly canceled, kicked out of baseball, probably for good reason. And frankly, so would Coco Chanel. Okay? But be careful. As you expand your horizons, you're not going to find perfect role models. You won't find tidy stories. They don't exist. But if you want to understand human nature, why people do what they do, and more to the point, how you can take advantage of that in your product or service, you do a lot worse than to listen to a crook, a smuggler, and a dressmaker. Thank you. Why don't we just take a couple minutes for any questions, if anybody has any, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of announcements. Questions? <coughs> Jason, uh, um, thank you. This is super helpful. might be a hard exercise for you, but if you were to have a time machine and go forward 20 years and look back at where we are now these last three years since COVID, do you see potentially a little black dress, a babe, or booze? Gosh, um, I would say that uh, we had our equivalent of the COVID pandemic in 1917, uh, the flu pandemic. Uh, if you think the COVID pandemic was bad, uh, the flu pandemic killed somewhere around 30 million people uh, worldwide, um, probably a million people in the United States with a much smaller population. Uh, uh, my grandparents knew people who died. My grandparents barely made it out. Uh, uh, it was a catalyst, that in World War I, were catalysts for the 1920s in a lot of ways, and I talk about those in the book. Uh, we're in a similar position. I don't know. I can't tell you the future. I don't know what it looks like. Anyone who, uh, yeah, I, I know what the catalysts are. I don't know what the future looks like. Anyone who tells you they do is lying to you or selling you something. 
Uh, but I can tell you that the uh, COVID pandemic was a catalyst. Uh, unrest war is a catalyst. Uh, artificial intelligence is a catalyst. Uh, I don't know what things those, what changes those will wrought over the next decade, but we don't even know what they will look like. People in 1923 did not understand uh, what it looked like. Only by the time you got to 1930, 1931, did people really start to understand what happened, and they barely did then. We're in the thick of it. There is no better time to be an entrepreneur. No better time at all. Uh, because there's no better time than the 1920s to be one. So by virtue of catalyst, there's no better time to be an entrepreneur right now because of the catalyst. Movement. Because of the catalysts that we have. We're, we shook things up, everyone. Uh, you know, by hook or by crook, uh, uh, things are changing. I don't know what they will look like in five years. I don't think any of you do either. Uh, but it's going to be a fun ride. Thank you. They're in here, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Other than that comment, are there any particular companies or brands that you're seeing in 2023 that you feel are doing true innovation? Boy. Uh, some of them are trite, uh, uh, but... Uh, Tesla is innovating, not in the way you think. It's not about cars. It's about electrification. It's uh, no one's going to give a shit in five years if he makes any cars. We're all going to plug into one of his superchargers. Is uh, that sort of infrastructure is uh, the cars are a red herring. Don't pay attention. The electrification is the big deal. That is a big, big deal. That's a sea change. That will happen faster than anyone thinks. Uh, I don't know lots of reasons why it can't happen. There are lots of reasons why the automobile wasn't going to go anywhere in 1923 or 1924 either. But by 1930, they were everywhere. And it happened fast, really, really fast. In the 1920s, it happened within five years. In the 1920s, you know, when we didn't have the Internet, we didn't have smartphones, we had nothing and cars took over American cities inside of a decade. Like, and you think can't, electrification can't happen in a few years? You're nuts. It's happening. Uh, there are so many other things I could, I, could, uh, I could talk about, but I think electrification is a big deal. Uh, big, big deal. Robbie? I just wanted to comment, I have two grandfathers who grew up in New York City, and one was a rum runner, and the other one had a speaking. Yeah, that's, yeah, kind of a coordinating, yeah, coordinating careers for sure. Uh, yeah, the, the amount of money you could make, uh, even if you're bad, uh, and that's the thing, you can still buy hacker craft today from that vintage that uh, uh, have the liquor holds in place. Uh, because that's what they use to, they'd outrun any clipper. Uh, the, the best estimates we have are that the uh, far less than 1% of all liquor that was, uh, far less than 1% of all liquor that came into the United States was captured. And that's just the best guess. There's no chance. Uh, they had about 1,500 agents to cover the entire coastline. Just do the math. That, that's coastline, that's ocean, Coastline, two oceans, Canada and Mexico, 1,500 people. Good luck. It was just a joke. My great grandfather's Yeah. Well, a lot of our grandfathers did. <laughs> yes, Justin. I was going to say on that point, do you see similarities with the legalization of marijuana? You bet. Yeah. That's, I, I make the point again and again and again in the book. And you can, by the way, they're free. I'm not carrying it back to my Tesla. Okay. I'd, I'm not an investor. I just like the car. It was the first, my, my wife made me get it. She loves it. Uh, it's the first car my wife's ever liked, by the way, because um, it's quiet. 
But the point is, story after story after story in there. What the 1920s really did and what I think the 2020s is telling us is the limits of what government can do. The 1920s saw a, the rise of the consumer, the choice maker, uh, who basically uh, told the government, yeah, you're not going to tell me what I can do and what I can't do. Like, I'll follow your rules to an extent. But if I want to have a drink, I'm going to go have a drink, and you're not going to tell me I can't. And basically, the consumer had, you know, basically voting with their wallets, uh, said, you know what, we're going to, we're not going to do that. And that's, marijuana's a great corollary to that, that uh, national legalization is inevitable uh, because it's already a fait accompli. Uh, that's the same with the rest of uh, harder core drugs. It's the same with the rest of prostitution. You, uh, uh, that's coming. It's all coming. It'll be regulated versus restricted. Uh, restricted, and that's the kind of the rule here in this book. You try to restrict things, and it'll just push them underground. You push them underground, and you, you basically give the mob a tax break. That's exactly what happens. It's an unintended consequence. It sucks. I hate it. I didn't. I. I. I told you. I promise. I. I. I might offend you. Uh, but it's useful. What I'm telling you is useful. But it might be offensive. I don't apologize for that. Uh, you're entrepreneurs. You can handle it. If you couldn't handle it, you'd already be. You would already left. <laughs> All right. One last. Uh, and I got to share with everybody, Jason. Anything to leave people with? Wow. That's. Uh, uh, I had some notes. Uh, it, yeah, I, you know what, uh, I think what, uh, uh, if I were to give you any advice, you know, kind of the same advice I gave in the talk, but I'd, I'd, I'd emphasize it again. What, uh, people often ask me after this, like, well, besides your book, hint, hint, uh, what could I read to get some good information about uh, uh, it, to help me as an entrepreneur. What's the number one thing I could do? What's the number one thing I could read? Uh, science fiction. The number one thing. The best possible thing you can do is read science fiction and read a lot of it. Uh, read, uh, who has read uh, Andy Weir's latest book, Hail Mary, Project Hail Mary? Okay, that's on your reading list. It is one of the most entertaining books. He wrote The Martian. Matt Damon was in The Martian. Remember, we probably saw Matt Damon in The Martian, didn't we? Okay. Uh, I think we're going to see Ryan Gosling uh, in uh, Project Hail Mary. Uh, he will be Dr. Ryland Grace. Fantastic book. Uh, talks about uh, what the near future might look like. Uh, Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves. Has anyone read Seven Eves? It's a book about the moon blew up and... The human race needs to get off the planet in 28 months. How do we do it? That's the sort of thing that thinks, it, it forces you to think about different things and imagine different futures. Uh, you are all in the business, we are all in the business of imagining a different future. That's our job. Okay? So why not read other people who do that? That's the number one. If, if you're like, I, I still don't want to read history, I'm not going to read your book. That's fine. Pick up some science fiction and enjoy that. That will help you. That's Thank it. You.